With the increase in model complexity, the need arises for us to be able to model on different planes or different vertices at any given time. This includes modeling on other surfaces as well. Up until now, we've really utilized one construction plane or C plane, which is the world top view, which is essentially drawing things in an AutoCAD sense from, from one view only, and then extruding them in a Z direction upwards. We have dabbled a little bit with drawing in the front view or back view, which is more like an elevation, but that is about as far as it has gone. So let's take a quicker, let's take a more um, deeper dive into what C planes are and uh, how they work and how we can um, create preset or predetermined C planes and then save them for later use as well. So I've just started off just with a cube over here and I've put the cube, I've placed this corner of the cube at the zero, zero point of Rhino. So within the Rhino file, you have this little, um, this little construction plane here, which shows the X and Y of the model. So the X is the, the red line and the Y is the green. And then obviously Z is directly up. So underneath the C planes uh, tab in the ribbon, you have all the common C plane commands. So for instance, we have um, set plane to origin. Uh, you have like set plane to surface, rotate them. And then there's different types of typical C planes or what they call, what's called in Rhino world C planes. So again, abbreviation C plane stands for construction plane. And it's essentially, it's the surface of which you're drawing on. So at the moment, the C plane is currently set to world top. Okay, so that's this plane here you can see. So anytime I grab a, a line or a curve and I just start drawing away, like so, that is on that C plane. That is on the world top construction plane. And that's what we've been using throughout the assignment thus far. If I change, if I click on any one of these, we can change the way that they draw. So for instance, set C plane to world front, you'll see that this plane will change. And if I start drawing again using that same curve, you know, it looks like I'm doing the exact same thing as before. But if you look at it now, I've been drawing on the face of that C plane, which is the world front C plane. The same applies if I turn it to the left or to the right C plane. And this allows me to then, you know, do that again, start drawing lines. And now I have lines in two different directions, one in the left right plane and one in the front back plane. I'll turn that back to C plane top, world top, and I'll just delete these. But what commonly happens and what's important is that you're trying to draw on an object. So where this C plane world front left right point is, is it essentially just flips it around this axis, which is the zero zero point. That's not going to help us when we're in the kitchen, for instance, and we want to, we want to model on top of this cabinetry here, or we want to model our kitchen here. And then we want to make sure that we're drawing, you know, an area to pull in difference where the sink is. None of that's going to help us. But what will help us is using the command set C plane to object or set C plane to um, face, particularly surface or face. So in order to do that, I've got the, my cube here and it's really these two, um, these two tools or commands that really come in handy, which is set C plane to an object or set C plane to a surface. And I've got to say that 99 times out of 100, you use set C plane to surface. So when I click on that, it's going to prompt me to select the surface to orient the C plane to. So in this case, I might say it wants to this face of the object. What happens then is it says uh, it asked me to press or to select the origin of that C plane. This isn't that important. To be honest, I usually just find a corner and I click once and it's going to ask me to click um, the X axis, which in this case is across the drawing like so. So what you'll notice is when I did that, that, that C plane has now moved to the face of this object like so. And now when I draw, if I use that same interp curve again, I might start on the face of the box like this, but then I can keep drawing out here in that command. And you can see it's perfectly on the face of that cube. And even when I'm not drawing on the cube, I'm still drawing equal to the cube face in space. A more complex version of this would be if I took the box and let's rotate it, say 45 degrees this way and even 45 degrees 
this way. Okay, so it's very hard. You couldn't just use world top, left, down, side, anything like that. It, you could never get anything that would draw on this angular face. But if I use that same command again, set C plane to surface, I click this surface, I click one of the corners, and then I click another one of the corners, and you can see that the, the C plane has now been set to that surface face. And so if I draw, even if I go and draw just say a, an ellipse, like so, that ellipse is on the surface of that C plane. Even if I start just drawing polylines off in the distance, and it could be anywhere, it could be like out here somewhere, that is still on the same angle as that C plane. So it's an extremely powerful tool, extremely powerful tool to reference um, where you're drawing from. This applies a lot to, you know, say doors is a good one when you want to draw um, objects on doors, you want to punch holes through doors or walls or whatnot. Um, it works really well for joinery. It's going to come up again and again, um, the notion of a C-plane, and I'm going to use the command set C-plane to uh, surface. And uh, this is a good, this is, this is just a short tutorial to show you exactly how that command works. Another important technique to understand is the having the ability to select faces and manipulate them on solid on solid objects. So in front of us we have a regular cube and another cube that has another cube bullying difference out of it. So to select faces, unlike normally when we select objects, we just left click on them and they select. To select a face, we hold down control and shift at the same time and then click on a face. Wherever my cursor is, wherever I click, that is the face I'll select. So example for this one here, when I hover my mouse over the front of this face and hold down control and shift and click, I select this face. It can work internally as well. So I might wanna click this surface in here so I can select that. And if I keep holding down shift and um, control, I can continue to, um, to click on other faces as I go around. I can deselect them by doing the same thing again, holding down control and shift, I can just deselect them. And then using the gumball, um, once that face is selected, we have a, a wealth of opportunity there. So I can simply just drag that face, move it to a different size. I can be more prescriptive with it where I can click the face and then use the move command, hit enter, pick a point, and then I can change its direction. So I can say, I want to extend this by, I don't know, 150 mil as an example, and then I click, and now it's extended 150 mil. I can click on the face and I can rotate it. So in this case, I might rotate it 45. It sort of freaks out, but it will do it. it turns it into like a helix shape. I can scale it, so I can take that face and then use my scale tool, holding down shift so it's an even scale. And I can even change the size of a shape that's been bullying difference. I just have to be more specific on what shape I, uh, what face I click on. So if I wanna make this box wider, simply clicking on this face and dragging it out won't work because all I'll be doing is moving that face without, le without this one, which means that this area becomes wider. Now that may be your intention and that's fine, but other times you wanna click on this face and you wanna click on this face and then you want to move them together in case, you know, for instance, we have a dimension that was incorrect. This is a much quicker way than going back to a sketch and re-sketching it, uh, re-extruding it, joining it, blocking it, doing all that sort of stuff. Um, so it's, a, it's an important concept to get your head around, one that we're going to use quite often throughout the assignment. So when I use the command or when I'm saying select face, what I mean is, is hover your mouse over the surface that you want to select, hold down control and shift, click, and then use your uh, the desired command. So in conjunction of what we just learned about editing faces and, and selecting and moving faces on, on solids, let's apply that to a block that we created or that I instructed you to create incorrectly last week. So our glazing walls, as you can see, they're, they're complete and they're all put into place to the right widths. They are, however, not the right height. So in my tutorial last week, we spoke about making these 2.4 high, when in actual fact, if we look at the uh, finished example, these are indeed full height glazing. And because the height of our, um, the height of our ceiling is 2.7 meters, of course, that means our glazing also needs to be 2.7 meters. So let's go into 
uh, our blocks and edit these using the select faces tool and you'll see rather quickly you know how easily this problem is actually solved so we have essentially four sorry three types of blocks here we have this this window type here window let's call it window type one window type two and then window type three um, for the sliding doors is actually the same as this wall over here because that is five meters wide and this bay is also five meters wide so we're able to utilize the same blocks so let's start with these ones here. So to edit a block, we just double click on it. And when we double click on it, we're gonna get this window that appears here that asks, that it's essentially part of our block editor. So at this point in time, it's saying, this is the window that we are currently working on or the block we're currently working on. We can either set the base point, remove an object of this to, um, from the block or add more objects. Uh, in this case, we don't wanna do either. We just want to work on these and manipulate the geometry the geometric properties of it. But if we want to add more objects to a block, we could do that. Um, a good example might be, I don't know, like say we want to add a handle to a sliding door and we've got one block that are all sliding doors. We want to, we could, we could do that or we could change the door handle types on all of the internal doors by adding a new object to it or whatnot. So with that in mind, I'll just put this to the side for now. No harm done. And we're just going to raise up these um, these windows. So the easiest way to do that is I'm going to use my select faces tool that we just learned about before. So shift control, I click the top surface of this um, window frame and then I orbit to the underside and I click um, control shift on the underside. So now I have the bottom and the top of that window frame. I'm going to use my gumball and move it up 300 mil like so. Okay, that's now done. And then with the glass pane, I'm going to use scale 1D because it is just one sheet of geometry. So there isn't actually a thickness associated with it. So the easiest way to do that is to use scale 1D. So what scale 1D means is it's scale in one direction. And obviously scale 2D means scale in two direction. Um, so with scale 1D, I'm going to hit enter. It's going to ask me to um, point, place the base point. So the base point will be... I'm going to zoom right into the corner of the glazing. So that's point number one. Point number two will be to ask me where does it currently end? And it currently ends here. And then point number three will be where do you want it to end? So you can see I can move my mouse up and down. I can even type in a value if I prefer. And that value will be the total value. Like so how long this piece of glass will be after we're done. Or in this case, I'm just going to move my mouse and snap it to the top of the glazing like so. So that's now at 2.7 meters high. Once I'm done with that, I'll just click OK and you'll see straight away those other blocks update. The process is the same with the others and we're gonna bring them all up to 2.7 meters. Considering we've already modeled door and window blocks utilizing extrusions, scales, sweeps and revolves, the modeling of floors, ceilings, and even the parapet is rather simplistic by comparison. Nonetheless, I'll go through the general workflow of how to model these up in quick succession and then leave the rest or, or the bulk of the detail over to you. So first things first, I'm gonna create a new layer and I'm gonna call this one flooring in capitals. And then as the same as always, you can have a sub layer for curves and another layer for solids. So I'll make sure that these are very noticeable. So again, I'll make that one like say purple and then the floors themselves. Let's make them a gold color. Okay, so with that in mind, I'm gonna to go to my top view. I'm gonna make sure project is turned on because I don't wanna accidentally, there's so many different objects in here now, I don't wanna accidentally be drawing on any other surface other than the C plane world top, which is the, the which in this model is our actual floor level. So because we have already gone through um, all of our reference planes and whatnot, this is actually an incredibly easy process. Um, I'm just gonna use a polyline and we're going to start with just our concrete slab. So our concrete slab, we're going to go around the perimeter of our glazing. So I'm going to follow the outside of our glazing. This is easy. You know, it snaps so easily because we have so many reference planes that are helping guide us. When we get to this point here, I'm going to cut back inside the building and then essentially just follow this around 
the inside walls of the per of all the internal face of the exterior walls the whole way around just be careful and make sure that you are snapping to what you want to because it's going to pick up a lot of different object snaps okay so that's now done i'm just going to find those those lines they'll be there somewhere there it is and then i'm just going to extrude that downwards because this is not a this is not like a construction drawing i'm just going to scale them down 100 mil that's fine so you're going to get this weird graphical effect and that's because the, the the background plan and the floor are sitting in the same places in space so i can turn off that background image and you can see now that looks much cleaner plus i'll change that to the solids layer there we go okay looking good so far so in this instance, I've chosen to um, model all of this just as one concrete slab. And we're going to use, or I'm going to utilize a polished concrete floor as my chosen flooring. So all this can be one material, but I will model some carpet flooring over the top. Now you could do the same with tiling if you like, or if you want this to be floorboards, you can change that material later on. It really doesn't matter. In Rhino, the geometry and the, and the material are not exclusive. Um, but you do, for the, for the method that we use, we in, you have two methods to, to material. You can either material faces of objects or you can material the entire object. In fact, there's a third option to essentially material everything on a certain layer. We'll be using a combination of all three, but that's for a later class. However, for now, we just need to know that we have a floor for our slab which um, which we now have. And then we're gonna model um, some very thin floors, maybe like a floor that's only 10 mil thick for our carpet zone, and that's basically it. And then also we're gonna model an area for our decking, because obviously the decking is a different material. We wanna make sure we delineate between the two. So what I'll do now is I'm gonna go back to my top view. I'm, f I'm still on my flooring curves layer, and I'm gonna go again with a polyline and I'm just going to, using my guidelines and making sure I choose the outside face of my glazing. I'm just gonna finish this up. Okay, beautiful perspective. Now this one I'm gonna extrude down quite a bit further. In fact, I'm gonna extrude it down equal to the depth of our building because we haven't modeled our topography yet and that will make a big difference. So if I turn where turn, if I uh, remove my background image, I'm going to change this material as well. I change this object to the solids. Yep. So we have like a, you can see if I scroll, if I orbit underneath, we've got our decking here and we've got our flooring here and that our walls come down, I think it was another meter below the, the ground level, which is the world seaplane top, um, which is the world top seaplane. Okay, so I have two objects here. So, and the reason why I've done that is because I wanna have the ability to model or to materialize this in a timber and materialize this in a concrete. Next up, what I'll do is I'm gonna go back to my curves, go to my top view. I'm still, I'm gonna make sure I'm on project as always. And now I'm gonna zoom right in here and this will be a little bit more complex. I'm probably gonna to have to go to wireframe mode here because I need to see the door openings as well. So I need to add a carpet right up to those door openings um, and probably up to the door leaf itself. So what I'll do is I'll use a polyline and I'm just gonna maneuver around the room, including that little nib wall there. And then I get to the door and I'm gonna zoom right, right in. I'm going to come up to here, all the way up to the to the um, to the rebate of the door. That's it. Come all the way across. You can see at the moment this is very sort of caddish what I'm doing. Okay, that's now done. Now again, beauty is at. Um, well, actually, firstly, when I go to select that line, you can see the selection menu starting to get pretty intense now. This is why it's not gonna come up with the layer that it's on. It's gonna come up with the object type or the geometry type. So in that case, a curve and then the color. So that's the only way I'm gonna know what I'm clicking on. That's why it's so important to make sure that you color code your layers. So I know that darker purple are the curves of my flooring layer. 
So I'm going to go to here, XS to zoom select. I'll change this back to shaded mode and I'm going to turn off project and I'm going to extrude this upwards and then just type in 10 and then enter. Okay, so that is my carpet, my carpet layer or my carpet flooring. Now at this point, if I change this to my solids, like so, it's going to be pretty hard to notice that that is a different flooring to this one here. So with flooring, we don't have many curve curves at all. In fact, we're going to delete the curves basically once we're done because we're not going to utilize them again or turn them off at least. So why don't we do something a little bit different here where instead of having solids, let's utilize different flooring types as different layers. So I'll make another one here and like we call this one timber decking and then we'll make another one and we'll call this one carpet. So for the timber decking, let's change that material to say like some sort of brownish color. It has no effect at all on the material. The color of the layer has no effect whatsoever. So I'll click on the deck and I'll change that to the timber decking layer. So now it's very clear what's polished concrete and what would be a timber deck. And then same with the carpet. Let's change that to the carpet layer, which will then turn gray for now. I'll leave the polished concrete as yellow. And in fact, I'll make sure I change the solids layer to be called polish concrete. Now, if yours is um, floorboards, just call it that. In this case, I'm just utilizing that material. Now, because I have project, I'm going to turn project back on. I'm going to go to my top view. I'm going to click on my carpet flooring and I'm just going to use the mirror tool. And because I still have these reference planes here, I can just mirror those two across. Whoops. I need to make sure that when I do mirror that I have copy turned on or clicked yes. So I just click on up here in the command plane or in the command bar. I just click on where it says copy equals no. So it changes that to yes. And then I'll flip that across. There we go. And then both of those, I'm going to mirror again using the center line of the two modules across. And there we are. So you can see how much, how much you can expedite your, um, how quickly you can expedite your modeling process by having modules and and like uh, and alike geometry and just using the mirror and copy commands. So that's now our flooring complete at this stage. We'll probably add some more detail and shadow lines and other items a little bit later on, but for now we've got the bulk of our our flooring there. So let's move on to our roof overhang and particularly our parapet and our ceiling. So the ceiling in this case is all going to be it's all going to be basically one material. You could make this as complex as you want, have different types of ceiling heights, different ceiling materials, whatever it may be. But again, we're going to make life, uh, try and make life a little bit easier for ourselves. So I'm going to create another layer and I'm going to call this one ceiling. And as always, I'm going to make a curves layer and a solids layer. Okay, now what I'm going to do as well, I'm going to start cleaning up some of these layers as we go. So I'm going to double click on the curves layer, but I'm going to turn off my curves in my flooring. Or in fact, I'm going to turn off my flooring in general in total, because I still want to see my background image as we work away here. The reference planes I'll keep on. The wall curves I'm going to turn off. The window curves I'm going to turn off. You can see that they were all just sort of sitting here out in space, but we're done with that. So I'll turn off those curves and even the door curves I'll turn off and then I'll minimize these layers as well. That's so a bit cleaner. Layer five is nothing. So I'm going to just delete that. All right. So my curves, I will make a, uh, I'll just make them a red for now. And the solids I'll make Let's make them a, a light blue. Okay, so I'm gonna go on my top view, project is on. And we need, before we start, we need one more reference plane. Actually, no, we'll do that a little bit differently. We just need a, we just need to sketch over the internals. This is actually very easy. So again, polyline. And this time I wanna make sure I'm starting on the uh, still, still on the outside of my glazing. So just there, it's important that I basically follow the flooring almost. Um, and I'm just going to take this across 
And you can, yeah, look, it, it's it's one way, it's one, six of one half dozen the other. So I can go across like this and essentially I'm just drawing the same curves that I used for the flooring before, which I can utilize. In fact, I might do that instead because the other method is to actually draw around each one of these walls. And that is technically the correct way to do it. And in fact, when we move into software like Revit, you would do that because you need to take um, schedules and quantities from the model. So if you start modeling over the top of walls, you're gonna end up with extra additional material that you don't actually have. So let's do something a little bit different here. Might as well utilize what we have. So I'm gonna turn back on my flooring layer. I'm gonna find the flooring sketch so that's this sketch just here. We still have that that we utilized and that will give us the basis of this ceiling zone or even better yet, let's just work with solids. So I'm gonna click on the polished concrete layer and let's just copy this straight up. So I'm gonna hold down Alt to my keyboard, click on the blue arrow and let's type in 2.7, okay? And that's that's, that's our ceiling, but we need to account for the thickness of the floor. So we probably need, we need to move that up again another 100 mil. Okay, so that's now sitting at our ceiling level. And you can tell that because we can't see our, well, it's still shorter than our inter, uh, external walls, but it is shorter than our internal walls. Or our internal walls are shorter than that. So if I go to um, say, I turn this into ghosted mode, you can see the walls beneath this ceiling area here. Okay. And what I might do, it doesn't really matter the thickness of this ceiling. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter at all. Um, I'm going to, however, change this to my ceiling solids layer. So that color will now update like so. Okay. So that is our ceiling complete. In fact, the curves on the ceiling layer, to be honest, I can just delete them for now. If I want them back later, I can find them, but I will still have a ceilings layer with a sub layer called solid just for um, organization. You can see here, it becomes much cleaner to understand what's going on in my drawing. What we'll do now is we're gonna to go to our parapet. So this is probably the more complex component or the most complex component that we're gonna utilize here. So what I'm gonna do is um, go to my reference planes. I'm gonna, first thing I'm gonna turn off my flooring go to my reference planes layer and go to my top view. So we know the distance between here and here is 1500. We need to offset another line from here to here to be also 1500. So we're in, I've got project turned on. I've got this line here. I'm just gonna hold down Alt to my keyboard and click the red arrow and just type in 1500. So I've got that grid line along there essentially. We're going to utilize that as a sweep profile for an object that we're going to utilize for our parapet. So what we're going to do to begin with is I'm going to, uh, again, create one more layer. I'm going to call this one roof. It can be called, yeah, roof or parapet, doesn't matter. I'm going to call mine roof. And again, as always, curves, solids. So curves, I will make red. And then the solids doesn't really matter. I'll make it uh, like a burnty orange sort of color. Okay, so curves. So what I'm gonna do is we know that the height difference, what we wanna do is draw the height difference, we're gonna turn off project, between the ceiling and the top of the building. So that's an 800, that's an 800 millimeter high parapet, which to be honest, sounds basically correct. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to my top view and I'm just going to draw a profile here real quick. So polyline, I'm going to draw a line that is 800 down. Okay. And then maybe say, uh, we know that the, the external walls are 250, but that might be a bit excessive. So say 150 across. And then you can go back up. And I'm going to turn on ortho. Okay, like so. But what we are going to do is we're going to add in the soffit as well. So the soffit is this area under here. So we're going to draw essentially this and this as one object. 
and then we're going to sweep it along this path that we just drew, at least for this zone and this zone over here. So what I'm going to do is I know that my parapet is 1500 back the other way. So I'm just going to draw a line this way and type in 1500. And then I might just draw upwards 100 and then come back the other way. But what I am going to do is I just want to make a little detail, a little shadow line detail here. So I'm going to go polyline and I'm going to go up from here. I'm going to type in say, I don't know, 30, come across say 50 and then come down and that's it. Now I'm going to use my trim command and I'm going to start trimming away this area. And I want to make sure I don't have a duplicate curve. So I have two curves sitting on the top of each other. So I have this curve and this curve. So I'm just going to explode this one and then delete one of these curves. So I'll click on that and I'll delete that single curve. All right, so now when I select all of this, including this and go join, that is one closed curve. So, okay, so what do we do from here? What's this got to do with anything? So I'm going to go back to my three dimensional view I'm going to click on this just using the gumball. I'm going to rotate this 90 degrees upright and then 90 degrees this way. And then I'm going to click and move this top corner up to this top corner. In fact, I need to make sure it's a bit cleaner. That's to the midpoint of the wall. So to be like that. Okay, so... What I need to do as well is I didn't quite draw that right because I made that one uh, 150 thick and then I made that 1500 there. So I need to bring this portion of the parapet back the other way. And I can do that quite easily by, I'm going to isolate this first, isolate. So type in isolate and then I'm just going to select these two points and then I can just move them back the other way. So in this case, uh, it should be uh, minus 150. Whoops, should go there, plus 150, my bad. Okay, so it's brought them back. And then I'm just gonna um, use the command, type in show, brings everything back. So this looks much cleaner now. So this will be my parapet wall. This will be my little shadow line. And this is my soffit. And it is going to follow this path that we just drew now. Now, or I can actually utilize the ceiling line as well. Because this is touching the ceiling line, I can utilize these edges. I didn't even have to draw a path, which is actually very, very helpful. Now, I could use this path down here as well, but that's not quite that's not quite going to work and I'll show you why so. So, let's utilize the sweep command. So, we're going to use sweep 1, but it's going to be slightly different before to before because we haven't already got a uh, rail or a profile uh, drawn yet. Uh, sorry, a rail drawn. So, I'm going to type in sweep 1 and it's going to ask us to select the rail. And then you can see in um, in the uh, in the parentheses it says chain edges. So I'm going to click on that because what that means is unlike before where you just click one object, it, it without you doing anything, it prompts you to then select the profile. With it here, we want to select more than one object as the rail to continue along before then moving on to the profile. So I'll give you an example. So here I've clicked on chain rail and it's saying now collect um, select the first segment for the rail, which is this edge of the ceiling. So you can see here it's asking us, is it the extrusion edge or the um, extrusion edge here? The arrows just mean, actually it doesn't actually mean anything for us. It might be in other circumstances, but I'm just going to pick the first one. And then I'm going to pick the next ceiling edge there. And again, I'm going to select the ones with the arrow pointing back into the ceiling. And I'm going to select this one here. And I'm going to select this one here, even though this will not be right, just so I can show you why. Once I'm done with that, I'm going to hit spacebar and it's going to say select the sweep shape. So now it's saying, okay, you're finished with selecting the rail. Now tell me the shape you want to um, sweep along, which is this profile we just drew. I then hit spacebar again. It's going to prompt the arrow back towards the ceiling. That's fine. And then spacebar again. And then I'm just going to click OK. I'm happy with that. Now we have our power parapet and our soffit drawn in one fell swoop. And if I just change this quickly to the shaded mode, that shadow detail, that shadow line detail looks really nice and sharp. Very powerful tool. 
However, you'll notice when I come over to here, this is not quite right because the distance between this glass wall and the front of this wall is bigger than 1500, it's greater than 1500. So if I do this, I've got a 1500 overhang. When I get to this point here, it's not quite right because I'm not fitting with that there. Now, I can utilize the move face command. I could say, I wanna select this face and I wanna select this face and I wanna move this from this point to here, I can do that, but then the shadow line still stays back here. And I could move the shadow line as well if I want to. Um, but look, it's much of a muchness. So actually, you can do that if you want to. If you want to do that, you can. Otherwise, what you would do, otherwise what you would do is just, I'll delete that. I'll sweep again, say chain edges. I pick this edge and this edge and then that and just do that. And then what I'll do is I'll extrude that shape on this side of the um, parapet um, and make that a little bit wider and just use the extrude tool and then join them both together. Either or is fine, neither is incorrect. And if you want to utilize this method, so let's go back to here. If I want to utilize this method, it's going to be a little bit finicky because I need to select both faces of the shadow line. So I need to select this face. I need to select this face. And then I need to select this face of the parapet and then the outer face of the parapet. And then I need to move that from that intersection up to the front of this wall. Now that is fine. That's absolutely fine. And then what I'm going to do as well is I'm going to select, I need to select that face in there because I need to move it backwards as well. So I'm going to go to ghosted mode, see if I can make this work. It's a little bit finicky. No, not quite. Look, that's fine for now. We can, we'll, we'll clean that space up a little bit later. But again, if I go to rendered mode, even just as, as a white model, that is looking very, very clean. Next up, we're going to create a couple of columns for inside our window wall, and we're going to utilize the array tool rather than copying those across. So let's take a look at the array tool in a little bit more detail and the different options that are available. Currently, I'm just outside of our model, and I've got two items here. I have a 150 by 50 rectangle and a 150 by 150 square. I've got a straight curve or a straight line and this interp curve here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just extrude this up and I'm going to extrude that up, say three meters. And I'm going to take this and just move this out to here. So it's a solid object. I'm just going to rotate that 90 degrees. And I'm just going to place this at the end of this line here. So to the standard array, I can just click on that item and hit array and I will just go uh, simple array and it's going to ask me the x direction and the y so in the x direction we want one because that means there's only one here if we said there was more than one then you say one two three so again if I could type in five and that will be that will come up and if I type in five here you'll see that will be it and then in the z direction I'll keep with one and then we can show a preview and then we'll ask us to click from one to the other. And you can see as I zoom out, you get five in each direction. And then I can just type in a number that I want them to be separated by as an example. So I could say like say 300. And it's a 300 grid uh, across and then how far apart. I could also make it 300, but I could make it say like 600. So 600 upwards and then um, five, um, 300 across. And now I've arrayed those out quite easily. The other thing I could do is in this scenario, I could go, let's do that again, just standard array. Okay, again, in the X direction, I'll say one. In the Y direction, which would be along this path, I can say, well, I want to have 12 of them. And then say, okay. And then in the Z direction, I only want one of them. And then it says here, the number is 12, preview them, yes, specify the base point. So this would be the base point. And then as I move my mouse out, 
I can again define the gap between them. So I could say, I don't know, I want 500 between each one, or it could be like a, a slat wall where I want say only, you know, a hundred mil between each one. And I could change that number from 12 to say 50 as an example. And if I do that again, I, I've got to type in the number. So a hundred between them and then enter. And then we're complete. And if I go out to here, oh, whoops. Let me just do that one more time. X direction, one. Y direction, 50. Z direction, one. Preview, yes. This is where I'll start. I want 100 mil between them. And that's now done. And so you end up with like a, like a timber batten wall as an example there. As one, as one method. Okay. So the other method to do is you can use array along a curve. So I might take this object and I'll click this and I'll go like this. And then what I'll do is I'm going to rotate this around just roughly, something like that. And I'll move this to here. Now that's not a fixed dimension. I, I sorry, a fixed angle. I just eyeballed that. So uh, it looks like it follows the curve. So now I can go array and then curve. And we'll say, select the objects to array. That's this button and then enter and then select the curve. And that's the curve that I want. And you can see how it actually follows that path and puts them out at a fixed, either a fixed distance up here or a fixed number of items. So I could say, well, actually I want 50 of them and hit enter, or I can change the distance and say, I want 50, but I want them to be a hundred mil apart. And that changes the density of them as well. And then when I'm done, hit enter and then come out and we have this really cool wavy wall of timber battens using just one simplistic command and one extrusion. It's a very, very powerful tool. The next one we can do is we can do a polar array. So I'm just gonna take that same batten out here and let's go um, array and then array polar. And then it will be again, subject uh, objects to array is this item then click enter and then say the center of rotation. The center of rotation doesn't have to be anywhere near the object. So for instance, the center of rotation might be back here somewhere. And then how many do I want? Again, I might say 50. And then do you want it to rotate the full 360 degrees? Uh, in this case, you could say yes or no. And you can see as I turn this around, I can specify the dimension. So let's say for instance, I want um, uh, nearly 360 degrees and it will rotate it around as far as I go, the 270. I can change that though later on. I can change the amount of items. I can change whether they rotate as well. So at the moment they are rotating around the polar, but they don't always have to. They could just stay as straight lines, though that's rare. And then you end up with a perfectly circular array around a center point, which I just drew. Okay. So that is one method of, uh, sorry, those are a few different methods of using array. There are obviously many, many here. So there is array, array, curve. so we went through array and array curve. We didn't go through array on uh, array curve on surface. That's a little bit different. Array hole, array pl hole planar. That one I haven't used before, I gotta say. And then you have um, array linear, which we just did and array, sorry, array polar, which we just did and then array linear. Um, and I imagine that one will just be in one direction or another. So I'll be honest, I haven't tried this one yet. So a number of items, let's say again, 12, maybe, and then say, what's the first point? This is my first point. And then the second point. Okay. So it's the same deal. The, the second point could be here. Mm, okay. So it's rather simplistic. So it's, it's unlike the normal array where I can have objects in the X and the Y array linear is just in one direction only. So that's fine. Okay, so taking those commands that we just worked on, let's create a um, like a star-shaped column, and then we'll place them in the drawing. So we're gonna this will be a little bit different to normal. So I'm gonna re I'm gonna remove the ceiling so I can see our flooring our, our floor plan, and I'm gonna place a column at this point, this point, and at this corner because this is all just a glass wall. So there's a lot of weight for that that glass wall to hold up. And the reason why I have this box here is to help give us some definition of the size. So I am going to do this on our walls layer because I'll just call them a wall. I'll go straight to my solids 
and I'm going to use my polygon and I'm going to click on the little arrow and then type in there star polygon star and then for the number of sides I'm just going to click on that and again I've got four there I'm going to type in four so it's a four started point and I'm going to start at this midpoint click and then move my mouse out to the end so I know it's 150 mil in diameter and then you'll see I can either extend it outwards like an out pointed star or bring it inwards as an in pointed star and then you know there's no right or wrong I'm just choosing a a shape something like that that's pretty cool and then I'm going to move this back into the box so now I know it's 150 by 150 now I'm just going to use the fillet tool to soften that up otherwise that will be essentially like four blades as a uh, column so I'm going to use fillet and I might just use 10 mil fillet let's see what that looks like Ooh, too much it'll be much less than that so fillet let's say three mil just to soften off those edges And then you can also use fillet on the other side too to, f to soften the edges internally. Okay, so I'll go to my perspective view, zoom in on that shape, extrude it out and extrude it up 2.7 meters. That's the height of the ceiling. And I'll drag that away. By the way, all of these I can just delete. I don't need any of that. Okay, go to top view, turn on project. And I'm just going to move this. Over to here. And I'll take one of these points. I'll just move it somewhere around here. Now, you know, we can just copy it upwards if we want to. So I can use copy and go from point to point up here for this one. And I'm just eyeballing it. So we'll call it 3.2 meters, maybe a little bit more, 3.3. Mm, 3.25, yep. Okay, and then the other one, we can just try and practice using the array. So I'll click this point here and say array, just standard, we'll call it array linear actually. The number of items will only be two, because there's just two of them. And then preview, yes. And then it's gonna say, select the first reference point. So the first reference point will be right there. And it's gonna say, go to the second reference point. And the second reference point will be at this point here. And that's basically it. I mean, that's the most simplistic way to do it, but it does work. And then that is it. So if we zoom inside, we've got a star column that looks like that. I'll turn that to shaded mode or rendered mode. That looks pretty good so far. We'll probably, we'll make them chrome or something like that once we have our ceilings in place because at the moment it's very hard to ascertain essentially what's going on because we have our ceiling in place but our windows are still solid. So this will look a lot better once we add some more um, texturing and, and whatnot. But that looks good for now. And it just gives us a bit of exposure to a couple of more commands that can be used in Rhino. Really, it's just a case of utilizing, you know, some of the commands we've gone through in this class, with, you know, like array, array along a curve, um, selecting faces, um, using different shape polygons. It's really just a case of any combination of any of these commands conjoined or con used in conjunction with your imagination is how you'll generate, you know, really impressive or really expressive designs um, within Rhino. The final module for this session will be to model topography. So I'm currently in my top view, project is turned on. I'm going to turn off my background image and my reference planes. I'm going to create another layer, call it topography with, you know what, a curved sub layer 
and a solids layer. The curve sub layer, I'm going to give it a I'll just do it red like every other curve. And then the solids, I'll do a yellowy sort of lime green. Okay, so I'm on that. Everything else is turned off. And if we take a look, oh, the other thing too that I've turned off is I've also turned off my flooring, my ceiling and my roof layer, just so I can just see what's going on with the walls. If we look at the example in the off of student web, we've got a very basic site plan where essentially, you know, the boundary of the site is on an angle. And then you can imagine it's probably just a straight line down here, across here, and then across here. Now, I don't know the size of this at all. And in fact, it doesn't really matter as long as it's just big. It doesn't matter at all how, like really how big this is. As long as when we go to one of these views inside of Rhino, you'll have a topography that falls and that will fit your camera. If your site is too small and the end of your site is here and here, well, then it's going to be very hard to get a nice perspective render of that landscape. And keep in mind, we are creating this landscape from scratch. If we were using a real project, we would have a um, topography model perhaps already there. We would have contour lines given to us by the surveyor that we can loft the, the contour lines. Um, in this instance, we're just free form modeling. So I'll go back into Rhino and I'm going to zoom right out and I'm on my topography curves layer. I'm just going to do a polyline and, uh, that's 160, that's 160 meters. So I don't know, let's go 200,000 by 300,000 and then back across. So it's a 200 meter by 300 meter block, massive site. And we'll do something just like that. I'll then turn this into a planar surface by just going planar surface. There we go. Perspective and it's just a big flat site in our model. I'll make sure I turn that to the solids layer too. Oops. Right click, change object layer. There we go. Okay, so we can edit this quite easily. Again, because there's just free form modeling that we're going through here. The site's on a down slope. Uh, we don't have to model it like anything. You could model it however you like, but just for instance, we'll model this on a down slope. So I can turn on my points and there are two ways to turn on the points to this surface is to either hit F10 on your keyboard or type points on or off, but in this case, points on. So the points are now on on this surface, but you're gonna find there's really only, there's only four points. There's one in each corner. So what I can do is I can click on those points individually and I can push the surface down. So you can see how the site's now falling away. And you can tell, because there was our original line there on our um, world top C plane at the zero point. I can pull it up, pull it down. I can even, um, I can even select two control points at any given time. So I gotta take this point, hold down shift and this point and move it together. And of course you have the ability just to move the surface itself. Now that's not giving us a lot of push and pull. That's pretty poor. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna to go to my solids layer, make sure I'm on that, turn off my curves layer like so. And I'm gonna use the command called rebuild. And this is a, this is a command that isn't commonly used in orthographic modeling or rectilinear modeling like this, but particularly when you get into freeform modeling and more complex geometries, you use rebuild a heck of a lot. Um, so I'm going to use the command rebuild. And what comes up is the rebuild surface uh, toolbar, which then talks about a U and a V count. So basically, uh, if you remember back to the first presentation about Rhino, NURB surfaces use a U and V coordinate rather than say standard mesh modeling, which uses an X, Y, Z coordinate. The UV is a place uh, in space relevant to a surface, whether X, Y, Z is always referenced to the real world coordinate system. So in this instance, it's saying there's two points in the U direction, two points in the V direction. At the moment, it's saying it's giving a, su a suggestion saying you can have 10 on either side. We could make that whatever number want we want. We could say we only want five 
in the U direction and 10 in the, in the V direction. Or you could say I want 50 in that direction and I want it 50 in the other direction, for example. The degree you basically just keep as five, to be honest, there's no, there's no real difference there. And then the rest of this generally I just keep as is. So you delete the input, the current layer, retrim, just leave them as is. So 50 might be a little bit too much. Let's try 20 by 20. Okay, so you can see how the grid appears. So 20 by 20, click OK. And now you can see how many more points there are. Now with the NURB surface compared to mesh, it mean we can pick one of these points and when we move them up and down, you can see how they softly move the other points around them. If this was mesh, it would literally pick up that one point and make it into a, like a pyramid. It's very crude. Whether the NURB system is actually sort of mathematically um, equalizing or evaluating the surface relevant to each point. Now I can pick multiple points as well. So I can pick this point, this point. In fact, just quickly, I'm gonna change the color of this solids because it's not helping that my selection tool is green. So this makes a bit more sense. There we go. I'll turn on points again, points on. So there's all those points and I can pick one. So that point there, I can hold shift and I can continue to pick more points. Too many actually, I picked the whole surface. Pick that point, that one. Just as an example, something like that. And then I can either click and type in a number or with free form modeling, I generally will just push it and pull it together. So if I pull that up really exaggerated like so, you can see what we've done there. And I'll, again, I'll change this color. I might change it to a light gray. You can see what we've done like so. So if I want to pick um, a row of points at any given time, what I can do is go points on and I can use my selection tool. So I'm just going to a top view and I'm just going to go left to right. Sorry, yeah, left to right. And it'll pick these points here. And then I could move those down like so. Or I could pick say like, I can't, I could go, I want these points and I want these ones up or I might want to randomize it. I want these ones and I want those to go down like so. But it's pretty sort of, you know, because we're picking grids of points, it makes it look pretty you know, pretty symmetrical or structured. It doesn't look very natural. So the best way to start in personally, in my opinion, is when we have our points like this, when we have four points, you sort of choose the general direction. So with this, I'm going to go points on with just the four points. I'm going to take this corner down here. In fact, I'm going to take both of these points here and I'm going to drop them down, say, I don't know, maybe eight meters. So minus 8,000, so something like that. And I might take one of these points and drop it down even more. So I might drop that down another, say 3,000, like so. So I've already randomized the site a little bit. The other thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn on my flooring again. And you'll see why this is important because now this whole surface is sitting below our ground level just by dragging down those individual points. So we're gonna to have to work on that. So now I'm gonna rebuild the surface. And in fact, I'm gonna start off with something a bit more simplistic. I'm gonna say 10 and 10 and say enter. That's much better. And now what I can do is I can get a little bit more sort of specific. So I might take these two points, drag them down a little bit more. Take this point here, drag that one down. You gotta be quite random in a way. So I'll take these two points and that one and that one and drag that up ever so slightly. These points back here. I might do something like that. And you could go really extreme and you say, all right, well, all this is, if you do something like that, that's fine. But you want to make sure that you're picking a center point and dragging that higher than the rest. So it appears natural. Okay. 
Okay, something like that. And then you might want to show some sort of depression area there. Maybe a raised area there so you can see now it's starting to look a little bit more randomized in its approach but now we want to make sure that we've got our floor covered so our building is floating in space and our, our flooring inside is sitting at the zero point. So that's a concrete slab is sitting at the zero point and really it's a case now of just going to one of our side views and this is going to get increasingly harder with you know such a big model and just move this up ever so slightly but you're going to need to keep referencing 3d model because essentially these external walls they can eat into your build uh, eat into the ground that's totally fine but you've got to be careful about how much because it'll be easier to overcook it because the floor is random it will it won't eat into the floor equally so even here you can see over here it's already starting to to dig into this side of the facade and that's totally fine that makes total sense but we've still got a gap down here so i can keep dragging this up something like that, that's not too bad. But I've still got like a gap here at the bottom of the building. Basically everywhere else is covered. And in fact, this is pretty good because we're almost at the ground level um, of where we step into the building. So that works pretty well. So what I can do is I can also go the other way. I can take the underside of these walls and drag them down further. So this gives a good example of where we have you know, submerged the floor or some, you know, gone into the earth and where we haven't. And what I can do is I can just use my select faces tool. So control shift, click the bottom of this wall of the external walls, click the, um, the green arrow and the gumball and maybe just move down another 500 mil. There we go. So that eats into that. Now the building meets the floor wherever you go. Now, again, this is just the stylistic design. Yours may not. Yours may, you know, you may want to sort of have yours floating above with some sort of baseboard system or something like that around the outside. Personally, I just prefer that. But if I go to my rendered mode, you know, we're not seeing a heck of a lot right now because everything's sort of just flat. But we are starting to get the idea of how this will look in space with this earth around it. And especially around the back, that actually works quite well. Now, if this wasn't working so well and I had high spots or depressions or impressions in areas I didn't want, I'll just go back to turning on my, select my topography, turn on my points, and then just play around with the nearest points available to me uh, and work that out. Or if I want to get a little bit more specific, select the surface, rebuild, and let's, put, let's bang on a few more points. So let's go 20 by 20 points. And now when I turn on my points, I've got more opportunity closer to the building to play around with this. So you can see I bring that right up to there. But be careful because when I do that, now all of a sudden inside my building, I've got topography. But because I've got more points, I can then click on this point right here and let's drop that down. So now uh, essentially I remove the earth from inside my building. That looks much better. But then see, I've dropped away from this point of the building just here. So again, I can rebuild the surface and I might go even more dense. So 40 by 40 points, turn on my points. And then I got control of these ones just here. Control points, those two, and just bring those up right near the door here, but I'm not affecting anything inside the building because I'm getting more and more dense. So it makes sense to, to become more and more dense with your point control, the further along that you go. Now, if you can't select your points, you can see some of these points I can select, some I can't it's because the met or the, the nerves is sort of equaling itself out with the control points, it's blending between them. So I might find my point, like that point there is actually underneath the surface. So if I wanna bring that up, I gotta go underneath and then just pull that up. But that is now fine and i'm keeping an eye that this doesn't happen where i start you know encroaching on the building again with my landscape so i'll bring that back to something like that and that looks pretty good so far all right so that's our landscape it's obviously massive but that's why we have it on another layer but you can see now even from here you can imagine what some of these renders might look like by having this nice landscape in the back and having this sort of random geography gives it a pretty realistic look. 
All right, so last bit to this is we're going to zoom out. I'm going to turn on my curves layer again. I've got project still on. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a driveway just randomly, something like this. So just some sort of curved line that comes to some front porch area that has a driveway and like a little parking spot or something like that. So, and then we can manipulate that a little bit later. So in my top view, I'm gonna use the command called interp curve. So I just type in INT and it's the first one for me. So it's called interp curve. This is one of my favorite commands and I'll click that one. And it's essentially a curved, it's like a constant, it's like a spline, but the way that it works personally to me works really well. So if I start drawing out here and I'm gonna turn off ortho, I want ortho to be off. I can just click these points and I just find it to be quite smooth in the way that they cur that they sort of blend together. There are so many different curve types in Rhino. Personally, I just find interp curve to be the smoothest. So when you click on it, you can then adjust those points however you see fit. And again, if you rebuild it, rebuild the curve, it will start to blend them out. So at the moment there is 13 points on this curve and we're saying we wanna simplify it back down to 10. If I say two points, and say preview, you can see it essentially makes it a straight line again because that's, you know, there's only two, one point, two points. If I say three, it turns it into an arc because it's rationalizing all of these positions of these points into the most simplistic version of me saying I will only want three points. If I give it more points, it doesn't, it won't smooth it out. So there's currently 13, but if I say like 50, all that happens is it just adds more points to the same position and it just becomes a more complex line. What normally happens is when you use interp curves like this, it's usually because you want some sort of like, you know, rather some sort of like rather accelerated curve like that, but you want to smooth out just some of these bumps here. So I would go rebuild and that's got nine points. Perhaps I want seven and what will smooth them out a little bit more. It will simplify it a little bit more. And I can always, you know, I can say, okay. And then I can always use these control points still to sort of say, oh, actually, you know what? I want this lip or this edge to be a little bit further up. So I use them, but they're much more blended together. So that's what an interp curve is. So I'm gonna use my interp curve and with project on, I'm just gonna draw some random line. I don't really care what. Just something like that. Now we can't see it because it's sitting below the surface. So I'm gonna change this to wireframe mode so we can see that line. And then I'm just gonna offset that. And I'm gonna offset it say six meters. Okay, so that's our driveway. And then you can see that it's quite nice and clean. And what I'm gonna do, when I offset it, you can see the difference. What happens in Rhino is this one is quite nice. So if I go rebuild, there's currently 12 points on that line, but the other one has tons of points because it's just the way that, I'm not sure why, but it's the program, the way that Rhino offsets a line, it will try and create more points to sort of overcompensate for it. I don't know exactly, um, but hang on, I'll just turn off my surface. But what I can do is I can rebuild that and give it the same amount of points. You can see at the moment it's got 167 points when the original one, you know, only had 12 points. So when I do that, it simplifies them, but you can see it doesn't, it sort of changes how the original one was. It doesn't look exactly the same. Now I can manipulate that and clean that up, um, or I might just pick a few more points. I can pick a few more points, but you know, maybe less than 167, but more than 12. So let's give that a go again. So rebuild and let's go, I don't know, 30. That's much better and it's much less points. Cool. Okay, so I'm just gonna use my polyline and I'm just gonna clean this up a little bit. So let's say it's just a straight line to the house. I'll just bring that back like that. And what I can do is use the fillet command with a radius of zero and say this point and this point are gonna join up. And then I'll use fillet again and I'll give this a radius of say five meters. 
and I'll do something like that. And that's our driveway. And then what I'll do is I'll just use the trim command and I'll trim that off there. I'm also then going to select these lines, hold down shift and then hit the join command. So that's now one constant line. It's still an open curve because back here, it's still open, but that's fine. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to turn, I'm going to go to my perspective view. I'm going to turn on my topography. So there's our topography. Actually in wireframe mode that really sort of shows the, the fall of land. That's pretty cool. And with those curves, I am going to use the project to surface command. So I'll turn this back into shaded mode like that. And I'm going to click on these curves. I'm going to type in project, just project, not project to C plane, just project, hit enter. And then it's going to say, what do I want to project these curves to? I want to project them to this topography. I then hit space bar. Okay. And that's now complete. So what actually happens is those lines are still there in 2D format, but I now have these lines projected on this surface, even though the surface is, you know, at all angles. So you can see as the surface falls away or whatnot, the curves still, these curves are projected like painted onto the surface. They follow that surface. What I can also do then is I can split the surface. So I type in the command split. I select the surface. I hit enter and then I select those curves and then I hit enter. And now what happens is this surface is split and separated from the other surface. Now, why would you do that? Well, what I can do is I could say, you know, minus a thousand or maybe 2000. Minus a thousand. Like so. And the driveway could be like sunken in like that. And then I could sweep around the edges and create like a retaining wall. So, you know, the, 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 it's almost like a step up into the house rather than a step down. And I've sort of excavated away all this landscape. That's probably not what we're going to do here. But the biggest reason is, is it means now I can apply a material to this area that's different to the rest of the, to the rest of the surface. But what it does mean is that once I do split the surface, you know, turning on my points and editing these surfaces does become much harder because they'll react as they'll react as different surfaces. So it's best to make sure your surfaces are joined before, um, while you're editing them. And only after the fact, do you split them into different objects, but it's really for materials, um, at least for our assignment anyway.